turn player two, what's it gonna be? Say hello to Lacey Phone Gear. This one can net you a grand. All right, spy fans, imagine this. Maxwell Smart has asked Agent 99 to pick up his portable phone at the shop on her way to the office. Where will she have to stop? The cobbler, the urologist, the tailor, or the podiatrist? Layer 2. Since Smart kept his phone in his shoe, he would need a cobbler, someone who fixes shoes, to do the repair work. <laughs> Hello? Max? What is it, 99? I'm gonna pick you up some odor eaters on the way to work, too. Category time. Player two, it's your call. I love the way you rule my number two. Now serving. Is it getting hot in here? 2,000 bucks for a correct answer. So, you've heard that the story about the Great Chicago Fire being started by Mrs. O'Leary's cow is a myth, right? Sorry to break the news to you if you didn't know. Well, imagine the Great Chicago Fire had been started by Mr. O'Leary's Cowper's Gland. What was Mr. O'Leary most likely doing when the fire started? Philosophizing, masturbating, defecating, or regurgitating? Take regurgitating. Huh, that answer has come up a few times. Player one, it's yours if you want it. Starting a fire by defecating? No, but I have been known to set off smoke detectors in small apartments. Ain't life gland. The Cowper's gland releases a small bit of fluid from the penis before ejaculation during either intercourse or masturbation. And they think they're going to need a bigger hose than that to put out the fire. Player one, tell me what's happening. Okay, give it up for really bad executioners. You give me a right answer, I give you 3,000 bucks. You've heard of the cliche, give someone enough rope and he'll hang himself. Well, suppose you give someone enough rope, but he can't figure out how to tie the noose. If he ties a shoddy granny knot and tries to hang himself anyway, what idiom best applies? He's cut the Gordian knot, he's hung himself out to dry, he's fit to be tied, or he's hanging by a thread. Let's take a look at the right answer. Ah! Solving a difficult problem in a fast and crude manner is referred to as cutting the Gordian knot. Other cliches for doing something in a fast and crude manner are cutting corners and cutting the cheese. Let's have a category, player one. This one's called, Air Today, Gone Tomorrow. Get it right, I'm handing over 2K. Let's rock. If you combine the participants of Wigstock with the Wigs, what would you get? Hippies in a wimpy alternative band, Ava Gabor's catalog with bugs for models, drag queens opposed to British rule, or members of the Truckers Union in Buffons. Layer 2. Wigstock is an annual drag festival, and the Wigs were Americans opposed to British rule over the colonies. We the people give the queen two snaps down. Player two, take your pick. You don't wanna blow it on number five. And this one is basic cable grammar. And it's worth $2,000 if you get this one right. Hey, cable fans, imagine this. The all-new Language Channel debuts with a comedy about the wacky adventures of two symbols called ampersand and ampersand. How might that show be listed in TV Guide? One of those and one of those, that thing and that thing, thingamajig and whatchamacallit, or doodad and doodad. Layer 2, it's yours. The ampersand is also known as the and sign. Of course, if you just see the symbols, you might think it's a show about three little stick men sitting down with their arms crossed around their legs. Keep looking at the answer, it'll all make sense. Hmm, I wonder what player two's gonna pick. Oh. 
pucker up for? A mountain couldn't, but Diana Ross could. How does $2,000 sound? Think fast. Because it's not specifically mentioned as a deterrent in the song Ain't No Mountain High Enough, which of these possibly could keep me from you? Death Valley, Mount Everest, the Thames River, or the Mojave Desert? Layer one, hit it. Diana sings that neither mountains, valleys, or rivers will keep her from you, but she doesn't say anything about deserts. <laughs> See, that's covered in the follow-up hit, Ain't No Desert Dry Enough. Layer one, it's up to you. What's next? This one likes to go by the original pet detective. $2,000 says you don't know this one. Hey, it's time to go dumpster diving. I'll describe the stuff we find, and you buzz in and start typing when you can tell me whose dumpster we're rooting through, okay? Now, let's see. Wow. There's a whole car with a gong and some gadgets in it. Janitor's keys, a number one super guy coffee mug, love letters addressed to Penrod Pooch from Rosemary, and a kung fu book. Whose trash is this? Here's what you should have typed in. He's a dog with a pet cat and the voice of Scatman Crothers. He's our number one super guy, Hong Kong Fooey. And I know it was just a cartoon, but was I the only one who noticed that it's a dog hanging out and talking with humans? And that it was the cat who solved all the crimes? Huh? Player one, your choice. What are we doing? Nice choice, player one. Kick player two out of the way, because this one's just for you. It's time to play Dis or Dat. The category for this Dis or Dat question is getting all mushy. I'm going to read off seven names, and for each one, I want you to tell me if it's a sad movie, a feminine hygiene product, or both. As each comes up, if it's a movie, press one. If it's a feminine hygiene product, press 2. Press 3 if it's both. And press 4 to skip. You get 500 for each right answer, and you lose 500 for a wrong answer or one you don't get to. All right, I'll start you off with 30 seconds on the clock. Let's dance. Stay free, movie maxi. Born free. Kotex. Yeller. Always. Summer's Eve. Last one, Peaches. That's all she wrote. You dropped a couple, but I've seen worse. Let's check out your total. Trying to put some food on the table. Let's keep going. Player two, give me something. Let's see what we got going. A stroke of advertising genius. Thousand bucks if you get it. Heads up, here it comes. If you were to take a photograph of the thing after which Kodak is named, what would your picture show? A type of South American goat, the Eastman family dog, the inventor of the Polaroid, or nothing. Eastman made it up. Take it. Survey says... Player one, what do you say? Should have picked this. Kodak doesn't stand for anything. George Eastman just needed something short and punchy and thought the letter K was really cool. And Kukla, Fran, and Ollie was already taken. Player one, anti up. Oh yeah, baby, it's the moment you've always dreamt of. It's time for a three-way. Okay, listen up. This is pretty simple. You're going to see a three-way like this one. 
When the correct three-way member is lit up, buzz in. If you make a match, you pocket a thousand bucks. But look out, it'll cost you a grand every time you're wrong. But don't be misled, this question may or may not have anything to do with the three-way as a group. <laughs> okay. Looks like our category for this one is bald, win, or draw. So that means this three-way is about the fabulous Baldwin boys, Alec, William, and Stephen Baldwin. Here we go. And for goodness sake, be careful. Oh, yes! Hey! Oh, yes! Well, that's all we've got. Let's see how it turned out. Player one, that was pretty damn sad. And yet you still beat out the competition. If you can call it that. Anyway, let's see the overall scores. Hey, player one, looks like you're on top now. Nice going. Yes, it's time to move on now, but I'll never forget our special experience together. Uh, whatever your name is. That's it for round one. Let's go to round two. Okay, whether you like it or not, everyone here gets a screw. What you do with it is up to you. Uh, one apiece. And hey, listen, you people didn't even touch your screws in round one. Come on, you won't go blind. Buzz in and hit the S key, then screw for all you're worth, okay? Okay. Player one, hit me with the category. The category? Hungry Hungry Hippology. Better wake up, there's 6,000 bucks at stake. Uh, let's see if you can wrap your head around this. Which of the following fictional characters would frighten you if you suffered from hippophobia? Mr. Ed, Henrietta the Hippo, Porky Pig, or Dumbo? Player <laughs> Believe it or not, hippophobia is the fear of horses, not hippopotami. And Mr. Ed, of course, is a horse. A horse? I'm not afraid of a stupid horse. Oh, please, 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 get it away from me! Your pick, player two, how about it? Shake hands with March Madness and other sports-related disorders. Get a right answer. You're walking away with four grand. Hope you brought your suit. It's time to get wet. If the Duke University Blue Devils basketball team members came down with a case of the Blue Devils, how might it affect their play in the NCAA tournament? Demonic possession would cause foul trouble, diarrhea would disrupt the flow of the game, depression would prevent them from playing, or a skin rash would hamper their mobility. All yours, player. If you have a case of the Blue Devils, you are depressed. <laughs> All right, Blue Devils, let's go out there and kick some butt! Oh, yeah. 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 Player one, tell me what's happening. Swing your partner one and three. A do si -do for the big third time. The category is... I Run for the border! Get it right, I'm handing over 2K. Hey, you know what they say about all carnage and no play? Imagine that Godzilla's enemy Mothra is taking a vacation to sunny Mexico. Because it would involve cannibalism on his part, which of these tasty south-of-the-border treats might Mothra be too horrified to eat? Papas fritas, frijoles saltandos mexicanos, chimichangas, or sol cerveza? Player Player one, it's yours if you want it. Papa's fritas is Spanish for French fries, and with Mothra, you can be sure you'll need to supersize it. Here's what you should have picked. Frijoles saltandos mexicanos or Mexican jumping beans jump because of tiny moth larvae inside them. So Mothra, you know, the giant moth, isn't going to be a big cannibal about it. Besides, I'm sure you'll agree, we don't want something as big as Mothra getting all gassy. 
Player One Gimme Category. For your enjoyment, something to make me sound eloquent. And get this one right, you got 4K coming your way. You know what? I actually had to look this one up. Um, what's another word for thesaurus, thesis, threshold, treasury, or tracklement? Take a shot, player two. A tracklement is something that can accompany meat. You know, like mint jelly, parsley, intestinal blockage. <laughs> player one, you can take it. Hey, Mom, can I have some money for lunch? What are you, stupid, slow-witted, dull, obtuse? <laughs> Roger lists treasury as another word for thesaurus. Don't believe me? Well, go ahead and look it up in your, uh, uh, you know, that, that big thing with all the words in it. Let's have a category, player one. You know that old saying, nothing's impossible? Well, that's just a load of crap. And you're about to find out why. The selection is, sail through Taco Bell. This very special question is going to be worth $20,000. Ever have breakfast at a Taco Bell? Well, you've got bigger problems than that. Listen up. Your local Taco Bell stops serving breakfast at 11 a.m. The bad news is you're on a boat out at sea. The good news is the Taco Bell is located on the coast exactly 50 nautical miles due east of your location. The bad news is that because you're on a boat, you can only tell time using a ship's bell signals. If you travel at a constant speed of 10 knots, at how many bells will you have to lift anchor in order to arrive at exactly 11 a.m. and get the last delicious Fiesta breakfast burrito? Four Taco Bells, five Taco Bells, six Taco Bells, or seven Taco Bells? Jeez, I don't see what the problem is. If you're traveling at 10 knots, you're moving 10 nautical miles per hour. At 50 nautical miles out, you need to leave at 6 a.m. to arrive at exactly 11 a.m. 11 a.m. is 6 bells. With a bell every half hour up to 8 bells, 6 a.m. translates to 4 Taco Bells. <laughs> now for the real tough question. Who the hell eats breakfast at Taco Bell? Player one, and up. Uh-oh, wet suck tit shine floor. It's time for Flippish Lesson. Your gibberish category for today is... It's like a different language. Ten thousand bucks if you move fast on this gibberish question. Now listen up. Every second and a half, some of the cash is going to disappear. So if you want to win big, you got to be quick. Okay, think song lyrics and tell me, what line from a popular song does this rhyme with? Never be muddy. Hang dumb to right. And don't let the punctuation throw you off. First clue. It's from a peppy 80s tune. Okay, so we've ruled out Richard Marks. It's from a peppy 80s tune that tells you to enjoy your evening. Last clue. Everybody have fun. Don't let me down, player one. Type it. Well, it's close enough for government work. Unfortunately, I don't work for the government. Player two. Your move, player two. Man, talk about irony. The gibberish phrase makes more sense than the actual answer. Your turn, player two. What's it gonna be? Number 17. This little number's known as Jim Carrying a Woman's Angst. One right answer and $6,000 head your way. Let's rock. 
If Jim Carrey's next movie were called Jim Carrey Nation about the female turn of the century crusader Carrey Nation, what major scene would Jim most likely perform? Pleads homesteader rights makes funny face, urges voting for women makes funny face, organizes mine workers makes funny face, or smashes bar with hatchet makes funny face. Player t- All those opposed? Nay! Player one, it's yours if you want it. All yours, player. Oh, what a shame. Hey, got a minute? Take a look at a right answer. A militant advocate for temperance, Carrie Nation was famous for hatchetations or smashing bar rooms with her hatchet. But if you think that's bad, it's nothing compared to what she'd do when you left the seat up. What are you... Oh, oh, oh God! Player one, your choice. What are we doing? Well, what do we have here? As the word turns, how does four thousand dollars grab you? So you think you know your soap operas? Well then, which of these opera titles is an anagram of a famous brand of soap? Aida, Carmen, Tosca, or Deflator Mouse? The letters in Tosca, an Italian opera composed by Puccini, can be rearranged to form the word coast, which is a brand of soap. I'm not sure what Tosca means, but I, I think it's some sort of condiment. You have the honors player, too. Step right up for question 19. May I introduce, they've gone down the drain, but backwards. Play your cards right, you win 4,000 bucks. Aw, oh, you know what? I had this song running through my head recently, and I couldn't think of the name of the band. Help me out by typing it in when you know it. And you do know it. It was this Australian band. They were really popular back in the early 80s. They sang that song about eating Vegemite sandwiches. Oh, yeah! Go for it, player one. Type in your answer and hit return. I told you not to do that! Make your move, player two. Go for it, player uh, Tasty. <laughs> they come from a land down under. They're men at work, but not lately. Category time, player two, it's your call. Question number 20. And this one is, The The Sings About Grammar. And it's worth $2,000 if you get this one right. All right, Ebonics hasn't taken off in schools, but it would make a great band name. So, complete the following analogy. Bad English is to Ebonics as new addition is to what? Old English, Esperanto, Hieroglyphics, or Sanskrit? Take a sh- Ebonics is non-standard English, and Esperanto is supposed to be the world's new international language. <laughs> but Esperanto never really had a chance after Bobby Brown stopped speaking it. Player two, give me something. on the screen and remember all's fair in love and jack here's your clue i can't remember your name but can you beat the jack attack we're about to find out
chicken shit you didn't even try! It's player two! Player two, you rocked! But let's not be a poor winner. I want you to take a hold of player one by the shoulders, wipe away those tears, and say in a loud, clear voice... You don't know Nice work, yeah. people!